Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. Welcome to First Christian Church in Valparaiso. Uh, whether you're here in person or online, it's good to see you or to be seen if you are online. Um, just a, a heads up to everybody. We, we probably saw the note about the masks. Um, Porter County is in the red again uh, per the CDC. So uh, red means wow, you're really having a huge COVID problem in your county. Uh, as, a, I, as of last I checked, um, Porter is, but not Laporte and uh, uh, Lake County, but I would expect them to be so soon. So um, uh, be safe. We, we really uh, are concerned about your health. We um, uh, ask that you, we hope that you like us. Uh, in, in general, but, but please like us on Facebook as well. Um, and feel free to share First Christian Church's posts on Facebook to let people know about um, what's happening here in the life of the congregation. Um, and, and particularly, you know, feel free to share the address that's on the screen right now so that uh, somebody that you know who you think really needs to be in worship, feel free to post it and tag them and, and let them know um, that they can join us if, if you'd like. Um, there's some other things that, that, you know, we encourage you to share, including the rummage sale, uh, which is a, a big deal coming up this next weekend. Um, you'll, you'll see in your bulletin some more information about the rummage sale. There's a sign-up sheet, actually a series of them, in the narthex, and uh, Mickey Kohler in particular would really, really, really like it if you could sign up to volunteer for any of those times. Uh, please do so. Um, and speaking of the narthex, uh, which was a little harder to do in the early service because the narthex was an outdoor narthex, so it's a little harder to explain. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are what we call narthex notes that are uh, by the window there that, that are two of them this week. We'll, we'll send them uh, in the morning to the people involved. One of them is for um, Pastor Greg's son, who was ordained uh, last weekend, correct? Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, that's right. Um, two weeks ago, he was ordained, and so we're excited. Greg's really excited, but, but we're all excited about that. So that's great news uh, for the uh, Eberhard family. And the other one is for uh, John Springsteen, who's uh, uh, still recovering from COVID. There is also a council meeting immediately following this service, immediately meaning when I get in there, and um, that will be uh, in the fellowship hall so we can spread out a little bit more. Um, and that's all I can think of. If there are any other announcements, I don't see any, that's a good sign. All righty, thank you. Please stand if you're able for our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Amen. Amen indeed. Now please join in singing hymn number 16, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Time. 
Please be seated. At this time, before we speak to God with prayer, join me in a moment of silence as we strive to listen to God. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, look upon all of us here today with the grace and support we need. Thank you for your never-ending love and acceptance. May we feel your presence in our daily lives as we focus to always put you first. Bless the athletes from around the world that came to the Olympics to compete. Thank you for the ones that gave glory to you for their talents and blessings. Bless our military, our first responders, and our leaders of not only our church, our city, our state, and our country. Keep them safe and guide them to make decisions that glorify you. All this we ask in the name of your son, who once taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I wish I knew when this mountain in my way is gonna move. Hope it's okay to tell the truth. Sometimes the doubt starts to win. Yeah, I'd be lying if I told you I was anything but weak. Right now my struggle's all I see. But I'm not giving in. Sorry, we have to defeat. Cause nothing can stop the unstoppable God. He's not afraid of this is the promise that I'm standing on. Nothing can stop an unstoppable God. Oh. Listen to the lie that says it can't be done. I know my war's already won. And I'm claiming victory. Because I know who's fighting for me. Nothing can stop an unstoppable God. He's not afraid of impossible odds. This is the promise that I'm standing on. Nothing can stop an unstoppable God. Oh.
Where does my help come from? Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Nothing can stop an unstoppable God. He's not afraid of impossible odds. This is the promise that I'm standing on. Nothing can stop an unstoppable God. He's not afraid of impossible odds. This is the promise that I'm standing on. Nothing can stop an unstoppable God. This morning, our scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew. These are verses 1 through 16 from chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go in the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said back to them, You also go into the vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. May God bless to our hearing and understanding these readings from the Holy Word. Amen. Amen. Well, it occurred to me uh, sometime this week when we were talking about uh, having to go back to mask or, or encouraging people to do that, that the only person that I'm aware of that ever liked wearing a mask was the Lone Ranger. And uh, if you remember Clayton Moore, uh, who played the Lone Ranger, loved wearing a mask or the mask so much that when they told him uh, that he was no longer the Lone Ranger and he could not wear it anymore and go to promotional appearances, he actually sued so he could continue to wear it. And uh, he lost, but uh, Clayton, being uh, very creative and ingenious, uh, got some very dark, large sunglasses that look very much like a mask. And uh, he continued to wear those as long as they would... Uh, want him and allow him to, to come to public appearances. So that's simply to say uh, thank you for uh, this confusing time where we hear so many different voices and so many different opinions. And, uh, and uh, that simply says to me that if somebody would just say, you know, we, we don't really know with certainty, but we're doing the best we can. And this is what we think is the best thing to do so that is what we're trying to do here to make sure that uh, as best we are able that we keep everybody safe so again uh, thanks for your uh, attention to that our scripture this morning is probably one of the uh, I was going to say probably it is one of the more con uh, controversial scriptures in the New Testament. 
And it's important to remember that it begins with the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like. And it's also worth noting that the story that occurs right before this story, this parable, uh, concludes with these words in the 19th chapter, the 30th verse. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And so their bookends, you heard in the reading that we, we just uh, experienced, that was the way this story concludes. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like. And the first thing that we are introduced to in the story that Jesus begins to tell is a story of laborers in a vineyard and people waiting to be called to work, hoping that they get a job. How do you get hired in Jesus' day? Well, in Jesus' day, uh, in towns that were large enough to have gathering areas, laborers, people who didn't have any work, would gather in a certain spot and wait until somebody, the steward of a, an estate, or perhaps the owner, came and tried to hire folks. And that's exactly what happens in this story. The laborers are gathered, and they're waiting. And some of them get called, and some of them get called very early in the day. Well, in contemporary times, we still do uh, something very similar. If you've ever been to any uh, day labor uh, sites, you know that when you go in there, you, you sign whatever paperwork, and you give them your social security number and so on and so forth, and then you sit down. If they don't have an assignment, and then you wait, and then you hope that somebody will hire you for the day or part of the day. And how long you wait is dependent on how persistent or how hopeful you are because you may sit there and never have the opportunity to work that day. The same was true almost 2,000 years ago. Laborers waiting, hoping that they would be hired to work for the day. And so some of these folks get called very early on, as, as we heard in Scripture. Uh, apparently they weren't, there weren't enough laborers out there to do what needed to be done, so the steward came back and got more. The owner came back and got more laborers. And still later in the day, even more were hired. Until in the last hour or so of the day, uh, still more came and were hired. That was not an unusual occurrence. Nothing unusual about that. What happens after these laborers leave the field and line up to get paid is where the unusual begins to occur. And again, if you've ever been a day, you know, worked in a day labor situation, or been in a day labor site, uh, it's not unusual for you to be able to get paid right at the end of the day. And that's what these guys did. They lined up, ready to receive their pay. And as each one of them come forward, <coughs> it's noted, because the last were first, it's noted that, that these guys, the last, the last people to work, got the daily wage, a denarius. They got the full, they got the whole day. If you're at the back of the line and you've worked all day, I think most of us would be concluding, okay, if they got that, what are we going to get when we get to the front of the line? We were out there all day. And so you know the story. Everybody gets the same. 
And then the grumbling begins. And that's certainly not unusual. Uh, People seeing what's unfolding and concluding, this isn't fair. Why did they get the same amount as we did? I remember some years ago when I was pastoring in North Carolina, they had a big controversy in the state because the state had uh, funded uh, teachers enough, funded school systems enough, where they could raise the minimum, uh, the entry point wage for beginning teachers. Good thing. The controversial thing was, if you were already teaching, if you had five years' experience, the beginning teacher was getting about the same amount as you were getting after five years of work. And there was no, uh, no suggestion that that five-year teacher was going to have his or her pay elevated. So, you can imagine, there were a few teachers that were upset, that didn't like that. Before I went into ministry, the corporation that I work for, the way they would adjust salary, salary administration, uh, and try to convince people that this was, was a good thing. In some ways it was. When they raised the minimum, then if, if you were in that particular category for salary administration, they raised the top end of what you could get paid. They didn't raise your pay. They just made it possible for you to earn more eventually. So you can again imagine there were more than a few people who didn't see that as fair. Why should somebody who's just starting get the same amount or almost the same amount as I'm being paid after I've been here for three years, four years, five years? That's exactly what is happening in this story. And the workers are up in arms. They are are beside themselves that the owner is not treating them fairly. That the owner's response is interesting. After the laborers have cried foul, The owner responds in this way. And it reminds us that the uh, kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is is not a, and the way God functions is not an economic theory. The kingdom theory is not economic theory. So the owner says, I gave you exactly what I promised. I didn't do you any, any harm. The, the contract, the, the agreement that we had, I followed through with. I gave you what I promised. And why is it that you begrudge me that I choose to give the same to somebody else? It's mine to give. Remember, this is kingdom theory now, not economic theory. All of us, I think, would agree that the way salaries are administrated, uh, the way wages are paid, whether it's 2,000 years ago or today, that there can seem to be and are, is a level of unfairness that can be associated with that. But what this story is telling us is God's generosity cannot be measured in what our commitment is or what our commitment isn't. Remember, everybody that day wanted to work. And it just happened that the ones that were called last, the ones who probably were anxious, imagine this. 
If you're a day laborer and you need money that day to pay for whatever expense it is that you have, imagine not being hired at the beginning of the day. Imagine being hired and that anxiety is gone. At least I'll get paid today. At least I'll have this. But if you're one of those people that are waiting and waiting and waiting, it's an anxious time. I mean, you wouldn't be there if you didn't want to work. So not having the opportunity to work and having to wait, there's nothing fun about that. The owner was generous with what he had. And he gave graciously. Well, that is a, a reminder to us that God's grace is greater than we can imagine. And that God's grace and God's generosity those things that God does are way above our pay grade in determining what's fair. I don't want to be treated fairly. That's the last thing I want when I stand before God. When I remember what Jesus Christ did to me. I don't want to be treated fairly. Walter Isaacson, in one of the books that he wrote about Benjamin Franklin, had a uh, story in there about Franklin being asked by a Presbyterian minister, uh, how is it that you feel, what do you feel about Jesus Christ? Where do you stand in your faith? And Franklin sa uh, stated his great admiration for Jesus as a teacher. And he said that it would do all of us well if we followed what Jesus teaches. He's the greatest teacher who ever lived. As to his divinity, as to this idea that God sent Jesus to save us, to forgive us, I'm not so sure about that. I'm willing to stand on my merits when my day comes and let God deal with me as he will. Of all the wise things that Benjamin Franklin said in his life, that would not be counted among them. I don't want to be treated fairly. I want to be treated graciously. I want God to uh, know and remember His promise that we are forgiven, that I'm forgiven in Jesus Christ. That's how I want to be judged. Gosh, if I'm judged fairly, I'd be in big trouble. I mean, I would tell folks, I do tell folks from time to time, you don't want me to, to be God to make judgments. You, you'd be in big trouble with me on some occasions. Because I just know, you know, I don't like the behavior. I don't like what you, you'd be in big trouble if it were up to me to judge. But that's way above my pay grade. And I don't want that pay grade. I trust a judge, just and loving God to make just and loving decisions. And I trust that he will never treat me fairly. That he will never treat you fairly. But he will, he will, through Jesus Christ, treat you graciously. It's always good to remember that uh, God's graciousness, God's generosity, that's above our pay grade. Dorothy Parker, columnist, talking about one of her acquaintances, said she's sure that she doesn't know as much as God knows. But she's certain that she knows as much as God knew when God was her age. And sometimes we can get confused. With, with where we are 
and the fact that we are all in need of God's grace, of God's generosity. And when we recognize that, we give thanks. When we recognize that, we realize that when God calls us to ministry, to service in Jesus Christ, first of all, we won't do that perfectly. And second of all, when God calls us to that, He's not calling us to be His advisors. He's calling us to be servants. So, the story concludes. Basically, trust me. That even if the last is first, remember that all of you are viewed, are, are treated with God's mercy, with God's grace. And we thank God for that. Let us pray. Lord, we always pray that we would be mindful that there, but there, but for your grace, go I. Uh, Lord, help us to be thankful for your generosity, not just to as we receive it, as we receive that grace, but help help us to be thankful. And rejoice that your, God, your grace extends to all people. God, we thank you that you are more gracious, more generous than we can imagine. We thank you that you don't treat us unfairly. Or that you don't hold our sins against, against us. But... You treat us graciously. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Our hymn of commitment this morning is number 548. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together. Amazing Grace.
You can still give by using the QRC symbol in the bulletin. There are offering tables at each of the communion stations and the wooden box on the way out. Would you bow your heads with me as we give a short prayer and blessing on our offerings. Father, we give our tithes and offerings to you. Bless and use these to accomplish your will through this church. We ask that every amount will be invested in the furthering of your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those who are here in person, we'll have offering in a moment, we'll offer communion in a moment, as well as collect offerings in the trays. Um, you'll be served your communion. Take it to the end of the table, if you would, please. Uh, partake of the uh, bread, partake of the cup, and just drop the empty cups into the waste basket at the end, uh, depending on which one you go to. The deacons will help you find the right place. Um, those of you who are at home watching this, we encourage you to get a cracker, a piece of bread, something for the bread, and, and something to drink for um, uh, the blood of Christ and participate with us. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are so grateful that after a lifetime of us crying out for justice, you deny us that and grant us mercy instead. We thank you, Lord, that what we think of as the Last Supper was just the first of many of these celebrations, of these rituals of forgiveness. We ask, Lord, that you do forgive us as we partake of this meal. We ask, Lord, that you help us remember, remember what the symbols mean, and remember how much you love us to cleanse us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. And on the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for your forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The table is set and all is prepared. At this time, would you turn to page number 405 singing verse one of In Memory of the Savior's Love as our communion hymn. question 
after a, a sermon I preached about the, the thieves on the cross. And you remember one of them was affirmed uh, by Jesus as saying, this day you will be with me in paradise. And after the sermon was over, on, as folks were going out the door, uh, somebody asked me why, uh, why would that person, you know, why would that person be promised that? Why would that person get, get something like that? I've been a Christian all my life. Why should that person be promised that uh, who's a thief and he's, he's on the cross being a executed for being a thief? Why would, why would that happen? And my, my response was a question. What is it about your life in Christ that has been so awful, so bad, that, that uh, you think it's, it's unfair that this person, right at the end, who never had what I hoped was you know, joy, the joy and peace of knowing Christ, knowing God's presence through Jesus Christ. What is, is it about your life that has been so awful that you would begrudge somebody else, even at the end, to know some peace and to know God's paradise? And not surprisingly, the guy didn't really have an answer for that on the spot. Uh, a couple days, three days or more later, he called me and he said, uh, you know, I've really become uh, in prayer about how thankful I am that I've had the joy of being able to live in Christ and to know Jesus Christ in his love and his forgiveness. I think I have a much greater appreciation of that now. And I said, uh, well, we, we all need to remember that greater appreciation. What God has done, done for us in our prayer as people of faith is that other people can experience and know that same joy and peace through Jesus Christ. We come to, that the, to this table with that prayer on our lips, thankful for what God has done for us as we experience this living reminder of God's grace, of God's love expressed to us through Christ's sacrifice, but through his resurrection, affirming God's forgiveness of us. Not resurrected to, to bring God's wrath on us, but resurrected to assure us that absolutely nothing, nothing is ever going to be able to separate you from the love of God that is yours in Christ Jesus. You're invited to come to communion. If you're unable to, uh, to come and to the table, know that one of the deacons will come and serve you where you are seated, you come as welcome guests in the name of Jesus Christ.
One of the uh, most troubling moments I've ever had in my ministry, I was with a person who was near death. It was maybe a day or two or so uh, before passing. And he had never made a commitment to uh, Jesus Christ. And I trust, again, I trust a God, uh, just and loving God. Uh, I trust folks to God. It's not my, as I said in the sermon, it's not, above, it's not way above my pay grade to determine you know, what happens, uh, how God treats, treats folks. But what the, the fellow said to me uh, was troubling. He said, I've lived all my life uh, without ever making that commitment. And it seems to me that at this point, I know I'm going to die. It seems to me at this point, I, I'd just be untr being untrue to myself to go ahead and, and ask for, you know, confess Christ now. And I said, well, God is always gracious. And even, even in this moment, whatever moment, God will be there. God will be there for you. He said, yeah, but I just don't feel like I'd be honest with uh, who I've been all my life. And so we had a prayer, and I left, but I, I don't know uh, if, if in the next couple of days or so, whether that, where that, where that man uh, was or where he got to. And I think more than, uh, more than a few people probably uh, feel that way. But know this, I know most of you have been members of this church for many years. But if you've never made a confession of faith in Christ, know that, uh, that God, that, that was God's whole purpose in sending Jesus Christ to you. And there's no timetable on that. There's, there's no penalty because uh, you're, uh, you've made a, taken a long time to, to make up your mind. God receives us graciously, loves us. God's always seeking us. And the Bible says for us to seek, but, but we're not the only ones that seek. Remember the story of the lost sheep. Jesus comes looking for us, especially if we're, we're out there in the wilderness alone. So know that, that God loves you and that God seeks you and that you're invited in this moment to make a confession of faith in Jesus Christ. You're invited this, in this moment to, to reflect on your life and give thanks for the joy of knowing the Lord and, and for the peace and joy that that has, has brought you, the blessing that that has brought you over the course of your life, giving you a way to navigate life's ups and downs, which are many. So give thanks for that as we sing, as we invite and as we sing our hymn of invitation, the first and fourth verse of O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee.
God, as we go now from this place, let us go in the spirit of your peace and extend a word of that peace to others that we meet so that when others see us, they might see Christ living in us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stop and stop. Oh.